Good morning. <clears throat> As Christians, the primary purpose of our existence is to, number one, to come unto Christ by following his example. And number two, to invite others to do the same. I have a few scriptures that support that. First John, second chapter, sixth verse. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. And in Philippians, second chapter, four through eight, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. He took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, one and two, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. In Colossians, third chapter, 13th verse. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also, so also, so do ye. One of the great challenges we have in our existence that we face is learning to prioritize to either seek things of eternal value or more importantly our or and more importantly our relationship with Christ or seek worldly treasures success in life maternal comforts material conference, possessions, things that, that distract us from that relationship with Christ. We invite others to come to Christ by learning by example, by living that life that others would want to emulate. We do that in part by how we treat others, how we interact with others. We do that by how we judge others. In Alma, the 19th chapter, 20th verse, but rather return unto them and acknowledge your faults and retain that wrong which ye have done Seek not after riches, nor the vain things of this world, for behold, you cannot take them with you. And in Romans, the second, 15th chapter, 7th verse, Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. Now, I'm going to read two scriptures. The same scripture, I'm going to, the first one I'm going to read from the King James Version, and the second from the Inspired Version. There is a difference. In Matthew 1, or excuse me, Matthew 7th chapter, first verse, are these words Judge not that ye be not judged making it sound as if no one should ever judge others. But in the inspired version, 
Matthew 7th chapter, second verse, it states, Judge not unrighteously, that ye not be judged, but judge righteous judgment. Jesus warned us to cease to find fault one with another. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, third verse, for with what judgment ye shall judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. These verses suggest that looking for fault in others or condemning others is what is being censored by Jesus. He has counseled us to be merciful, to deal justly, to judge others righteously, and to do so under the influence of the Spirit. In other words, to follow his example. I have an example. One Sunday after church, I was heading to my car, and Paul Thompson was walking alongside me. And I was trying to think of a conversation to have with Paul. And I knew that, or at least in times past, I would always ask him about his, his um, cantaloupes. And I also knew that he had quit growing cantaloupes. And so I was struggling for something that I talked to him about. And I knew Paul lived on the south side of Oak Grove, Oak Grove proper, on some land. And I had a friend that lived on the north side of Oak Grove and also was a longtime resident, as Paul was. And so, as a long shot, I said, Paul, do you know so-and-so. He said, well, I, yes, I do. Well, I was, I was stunned. So I asked Paul, how do you know this individual? And he said that he had had a cord of firewood stacked on his property on the road, and he had a sign that said, for sale with a phone number. And this gentleman called him and said he'd like to stop by and talk to Paul about buying this quart of wood. And so they agreed to meet. And the next day, this gentleman came by and talked to him about buying this quart of wood. And so Paul said he quoted him what he thought was a fair price. And this gentleman said, well, I have a small trailer. Would you sell one-third of that quarter wood? And Paul agreed to do that. So he dropped the price by two-thirds, gave him a revised, revised price, and they agreed to sell the one-third quart of firewood, and this individual paid him. He said he would be by in a couple of days to pick up that one-third quart of firewood. Well, a couple of days later, this individual came by with a much larger trailer and proceeded to stack that entire cord of wood on this larger trailer, and he drove off. I told Paul, 
that I had a vehicle with a trailer hitch and I would be willing to go over and unstack that one third cord of firewood on, my, on this individual's property, bring back the trailer and restack what's left on his property. And he said, you don't need to do that. He said, I'm fine. I must have misunderstood what the intent of how this sale was to be, to be done. But I kept insisting that I helped him in some way. And he said, you don't need to do anything. Now, for those of you who knew Paul, what I'm about to say next will not surprise you. During that entire conversation, he showed no animus, no animosity, no ill feelings. toward this other individual. In my opinion, Paul was dis displaying righteous judgment. Now, there's a second part to this story. I'm going to read to you Romans 14th chapter, 13th verse. Let us not Therefore, judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. A good scripture to keep in the back of our minds as we deal with each other. That's exactly what I did. I tried to put a stumbling block in Paul's way. Could my hasty judgment, could my hasty judgment of this situation and the man involved and Paul cause Paul some, some sort of a stumbling block? He certainly was at rest of the decision he made, but yet, I think I was in his way. In 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, 28th verse, are these words. Let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And in 2 Corinthians, 13th chapter, 5th verse, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves. How that Jesus is in you, except that ye be retrobates. As I reflect on that story, it has caused me to examine myself. Self-examination is an important part of living as Christians because we are by nature the natural man. We sometimes prefer self-deception because deceiving ourselves is easy, it's comfortable. We want to believe ourselves better than we are, smarter and more ethical. So careful, spirit-directed self-examination keeps us honest with ourselves and with God. Each month, we have the opportunity to self-examine and to repent in preparation for the sacraments that we take. 
What have we done differently in the past month? Changed our priorities? Studied our scriptures more? Increased our prayer life? Judged less? Each of us have our own list. But what we would choose to but what we choose to do differently this month as we once again repent and commit our lives to Christ, partaking of the Lord's Supper Supper. Hopefully we will strive harder to live by Christ's example. And hopefully we will invite others to do the same.